This is the fourth lesson in our series on A Time to Grow. This is a discipleship course intended for new converts. In this lesson, we are going to cover the doctrine of prayer. Now, prayer is simply you talking to God. Bible reading is God talking to you. If you only read your Bible but don't take time to pray, your relationship becomes one-sided. That is, it's a monologue and God desires a dialogue. Here's what you will learn in this lesson to help you grow. First of all, commands to pray. Secondly, conditions for having a successful prayer life. We will show you what prayer is and what it is not. There will be obstacles in your prayer life, some assurances concerning prayer, types of prayer, biblical examples of prayer, and heresies concerning prayer. Let's begin in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. There we will see the command for the Christian to pray. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. That's a command in the New Testament for the Christian to pray. In Ephesians chapter 6, which is a chapter concerning the spiritual armor that a Christian is to wear, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, as part of that armor, the Bible says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. As we are commanded to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, the last bit of armor that the Bible tells a Christian to put on is the armor of a prayer life. Look with me in Luke chapter 18 and verse number 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So there the Lord Jesus Christ gives a command that we are to always pray and not grow weary in praying. Now, some conditions of having a successful prayer life. If we are always to pray, and if prayer is part of our spiritual armor, and if we are to pray without uh, um, ceasing, then we should understand that we desire a successful prayer life. And there are some conditions that the Lord has given us in Scripture that will show us what those conditions are for a successful prayer life. First of all, God desires fellowship in our prayer. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 3, the Bible says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. God desires of us prayer, and God desires that prayer to be a time of fellowship with him and with the Father through the Holy Spirit. John chapter 15 and verse number 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Part of prayer is asking. And in that asking, we are abiding with our Father, through our, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is an aspect of fellowship, which he desires. Luke chapter 18. Remember when God created Adam in the Garden of Eden, he created him for his pleasure and for fellowship. And so God saves you for the same. He saved, he saved you for his pleasure, but also so that he might be able to fellowship with us. Luke chapter 18 and verse number 9. And he spake this parable unto certain, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. 
The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as would not would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his hell justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. There we see a condition for a successful prayer life is to have a humble prayer life, to come to the Lord with a humble heart and not with a proud heart. The Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. In Jeremiah chapter 29, going into the Old Testament for a second, and in verse number 12, we will see a condition for a successful prayer life. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me, and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 2. For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. So we see another condition here for a successful prayer life is not only to be humble, but to be of a contrite spirit. That is to submit yourself to the will of God in prayer. Now go to Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. Now, the doctrinal context of this passage, of course, is dealing with the nation of Israel and the condition at which God has placed upon them in the Old Testament to reclaim the land. And it also applies to the future for the Jews coming out of the tribulation to get their millennial inheritance. But a practical spiritual application, clearly for the Christian, is built upon the verses which we've already looked at. That is, to humble yourself, to seek the Lord with all your heart. And then he adds here, turn from their wicked ways. Within our prayer life, if we desire fellowship and we desire to have the blessings of God and the answers that we desire from the Lord, it would be a good thing to consider, is there anything I need to repent of? We should also come to him with an attitude and with a spirit with of confidence and boldness. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. The Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we can come to the Lord in confidence, in boldness, not as the uh, Pharisee did, declaring our goodness and our righteousness and all that we have done, therefore we must be heard. And yet we come boldly in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name that is above every name, knowing that he is the reason we are there. And while we are there, we should desire for his mercy and we should desire his grace to help in our times of need. Secondly, God desires faith in our prayer. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6, the Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So the essential thing for a Christian to have in his prayer life is to have faith in prayer. Look at James, the very next book after Hebrews, James chapter 1 and verse number 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, 
that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth them not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. In the book of Mark, chapter number 11, and verse number 24. Mark chapter 11, and verse 24. Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe, that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Remember the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Then the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That is, that faith and belief go hand in hand. They're both sides of the same coin. And the same thing is true with prayer. When you come to the Lord in faith, you must go to Him believing. Now go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21 and verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. In all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. There we see that faith and believing are one of the same. Now, what should we ask for in prayer? You know, should we ask for mountains to be removed and cast into the sea? Well, if you can't pray it in faith, believing that God will do it, then you shouldn't spend your time praying over it. Luke chapter 11 and verse number 9. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So the Bible says we are to ask, seek, and knock. John chapter 14 and verse number 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So the question is, is what you're asking for going to bring glory to God? Or is it for yourself to bring glory to yourself? Now God answers your prayers so that he might be glorified and because he loves us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. But the same thing could be true in not answering our prayers. Sometimes God not answering the things that we ask for brings glory to him. And he doesn't give them to us because he loves us and knows what is best for us. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. If we expect God to answer our prayers, then God should expect from us that we would, one, keep his commandments, and two, do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. James chapter 4, James 4 verse 2. Ye lust, and have not. Ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight, and war. Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask, and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So there are some reasons why uh, not all prayers are answered. One, they're not answered because we just don't ask. And two, they're not answered because we ask according to our lusts and not according uh, to faith or according to the will of God. Let's look now at some hindrances to having a healthy prayer life. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are your three main enemies. The worst of those, honestly, will be your own flesh. The flesh grows tired. It grows weary. It gets faint. It, it gets consumed by other things making less and less time for fellowship and prayer. Psalm chapter 66 and verse 18 gives us a hindrance to our prayers. The Bible says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The truth of the matter is, if you are regarding iniquity in your heart, 
you will not want to go to the Lord in prayer. Remember, we are supposed to uh, pray with our whole heart, to seek after the Lord with our whole heart. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Something that could hinder your prayer life is not having a healthy and happy marriage. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 26. The Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So having a bitter heart, that's a sin. And that will cause you to not have a and maintain a healthy uh, prayer life. Look at verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. A good way to start in your prayer is to ask God to forgive you for anything that you have said to someone that's unkind, or to ask uh, God to help you to forgive someone who has said something unkind uh, towards you. Look at 1 John chapter 1. And verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that is talking about our fellowship. Remember 1 John chapter 1 verse 3. But how God's, God desires fellowship with us. And he gets that uh, in our prayer life. But if we have sin in our heart and regard that iniquity, it will hinder our fellowship. So God desires us to confess our sins and then also to forgive the sins of others. There are four kinds of bad attitudes that will hinder your prayer life. These are found in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 28 through 30. There we read, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For, one, that they hated knowledge. Two, did not choose the fear of the Lord. Three, they would none of my counsel. And four, they despised all my reproof. You say, well, how do I know that I'm guilty of any one of those attitudes there? Well, if you hate knowledge, you're not going to want to spend time in the Word of God. You're not going to want to spend time in church around the Bible. If you choose not to fear the Lord, then you're going to do what makes you happy and not what pleases the Lord. Uh, number three, they would none of my counsel. Again, you're not going to want to spend any time uh, getting instruction from the Word of God or getting counsel uh, from the pastor or from brothers and sisters in Christ who have been there and done that. And lastly, they despised all my reproof. You're not going to like Bible preaching because Bible preaching is meant to uh, reprove you. So those four bad attitudes will be a great hindrance to your prayer life. All right, now there are promises uh, concerning prayer and promises concerning God answering our prayers. Look at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse number 9. Jesus says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son ask if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? There are three types of answers to prayer. Yes, no, and maybe. But he always answers. And he always uh, delivers on his promises. Now, he may not do it the way that you think he should. And he may not do uh, what you would like him to do. But he will do what is right and just and perfect according to his will. Remember, three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and maybe. 
And then again, according to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, when we do pray, we should have confidence that he hears us and that he will do what is best for us. All right, now those are promises. Look at me in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And the Bible says in verse number 28, And we know, so we can have confidence, this is a promise that we can be sure of, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So there are uh, two groups there that the Lord uh, promises things to concerning our prayer life and doing uh, what's right according to the will of God. One, he'll do what's right uh, to them that love him. And number two, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Well, we know that these are his children. So God will do uh, what is right and what is just and what is perfect for his children. That's not a promise that the unsaved person can claim, but that is a promise that the Christian can claim. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. See, the unsaved person does not have the Spirit of God inside them. They have no intercessor, but you do as a child of God. You have the Holy Spirit interceding for you, but not just him alone. You have the Lord Jesus Christ interceding for you. Look at verse 34 of Romans 8. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Let's look now at some people to pray for. Look with me in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. Who should we pray for? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now that's tough to get a hold of, but the Bible says to pray for your enemies. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Anybody who is responsible for preaching and teaching the Word of God needs your prayers. Pastors, missionaries, evangelists, youth group leaders, prison workers, nursery workers, Sunday school teachers, junior church workers, uh, bus ministry, uh, so forth and so on. And Paul says, uh, pray for me. He coveted the prayers of the saints, knowing what... Um, uh, things uh, might befall a, a Christian uh, who's striving in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. There we see four aspects of prayer for others. One, supplications, asking that God might supply the needs of others. Two, prayers, just praying for other people. Three, interceding on the behalf of others. And four, giving thanks for others. Now, there are three groups of individuals here that God, are tell, that God tells us to supplicate, pray, intercede, and give thanks for. Number one, for all men. That includes friends, family, and foes. Number two, for kings. Now, we don't live in a monarchy, but we do uh, live in a democratic republic. And therefore, uh, we are to pray for our president, regardless of who he is, and for all that are in authority. That's anybody that has a role of authority in your life. Let's now look at some reasons to pray. The first, staying here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, we find that it is a good reason to pray so that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. Number two, it's godly to pray in all godliness and honesty, the Bible says. Thirdly, it's good to pray. Look at verse 3. 
for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And fourthly, the Bible says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. A reason to pray for others is so that others might be saved. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Another reason to pray is so that way we're not deceived. All right. And then lastly, a reason to pray is verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. God will deliver us and others out of uh, tough spots when we pray. These are good reasons uh, for a Christian to spend time in prayer. I want to give you now some heresies concerning prayer. Now, these heresies are found out in the world amongst the lost and within other religions. And hopefully, if you go back and listen to this lesson, take notes, and then build upon this lesson with your own personal study, you will have answers to refute these uh, heresies from the Word of God. All right, the first heresy that you might hear is that God hears and answers all prayers of saved and unsaved alike. Now, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible says that um, all things work together uh, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So only those who are born again, children of God, is God obligated to um, answer prayers for. Number two, God only hears and answers prayers if a Christian has no sin. Now remember, God answers or hears all our prayers, and he can answer any prayer of a Christian. Uh, however, a Christian is probably not going to spend much time in prayer if he is engaged in sin. Of course, the first prayer a Christian should um, make if there is sin in his life is a confession of sin, repentance. Number three, God does not require my prayers because he already knows my needs. Remember, God desires uh, fellowship according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, number four, God will give me everything I ask because I'm his child. That sounds like a spoiled brat. And that's not how God operates. Number five, God is not real, and therefore my prayer is not necessary. Number six, God requires charms to hear my prayers. But that goes contrary to Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, where the Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So no charms, no idols, uh, no devices are required or needed in order to access a uh, prayer life. Number seven, God commands me to pray to Mary for my prayers to be heard. Number eight, God has specific words I must say and repeat for my prayers to be heard. And this again is in Matthew chapter six, verse seven, where we don't use vain repetitions. All right, lastly, I want to give you a few references for you to study in your own time. And these verses will give you some various examples of prayer found in the Bible. Now, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, that we should pray without ceasing. Now, it doesn't say any specific amount of time to pray. It just says pray without ceasing. So this could be any time of the day. This could be um, throughout the entire day, it could be in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, all three parts. Uh, it could be at your house, it could be in your bed, it could be on your knees, it could be outside, it could be while standing at work, it could be uh, while you pray over your meal. Uh, there are multiple places and times uh, where a Christian can find himself praying. And these references will show you just that. Mark chapter 1 in verse 35, you'll see there what time Jesus prayed according to that verse and also where he was praying. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6 will give you a best place scenario as to where you could pray. Daniel chapter 3 verse 10 will give you how often Daniel prayed. Jonah chapter 2 verse 1, 
you'll see there where Jonah prayed. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 through 15, shows you how Hannah prayed. And Luke chapter 2, verse 37, it'll show you about a woman by the name of Anna and how she served God as a widow. All right, I hope this is a blessing to you. I hope you find time to spend with the Lord in prayer as uh, you fellowship with him. And may God bless.